It was day three of my first ever cruise. It was a six night Western Caribbean cruise on Royal Caribbean's Odyssey of the Seas. Each day I would get up around 5.30 a.m. and immediately head to one of my favorite spots, the top part of the bridge wing. From there I could get a good view of the docking procedure and get a fantastic vantage point of all the ships coming in with no one around to bother me. Upon entering the port side wing, I could see we were getting ready to maneuver into the port, but I could not see it yet. Out in the distance, probably about a mile away, was the Celebrity Apex, an edge-class vessel and, at the time, Celebrity Cruises' newest vessel in service. I focused my attention on her as Odyssey began to swing to line up with the pier. Within a minute, it was visible, and I turned around to see what ships were already there. The first one I saw was Aida Cruises' Aida Diva, but the next one I saw left me speechless and numb in the mind as it was literally one of the things that changed my life when I first learned about her at a young age. It was Royal Caribbean's Oasis of the Seas, just sitting there about half a mile away. I could not believe my eyes. A ship that I had developed a strong personal connection with was just ahead of me. There she was in person. I'm honestly surprised I didn't just start jumping up and down and squealing like a maniac because I was that excited to finally see her. Oasis of the Seas represents a revolution and evolution in passenger ship design, development, and construction. Even so, there are some who question her very existence. Oasis is a ship that many said should not have worked. Ever since the dawn of the passenger ship, there were always people who said something could not be done or it just wouldn't work. Sometimes those skeptics were right, but oftentimes they were wrong. The story of Oasis has been one many decades in the making. It is one full of uncertainty, collaboration, anxiety, risk, but of all, foresight. Like many revolutionary ocean liners of the past, she was questioned, scoffed at, even discouraged from being a reality. Indeed, many revolutionary passenger ships, both built and unbuilt, successful or mediocre, suffered from such skepticism. But in the mid-2000s, her owners took a $1.4 billion risk and set out to create something on such a scale that it hardly fails to draw anyone's curiosity. What started out as a one, possibly two vessel gamble would soon turn into a class of six, possibly seven imposing vessels. It would result in the largest and one of the most successful passenger ship classes in history. Oasis of the Seas and her sisters would, for better or worse, change the course of an entire industry forever. Before diving into the history and background of Oasis of the Seas, I want to take some time and explain why this ship, in my opinion, should be remembered as being more than, in some people's minds, an ugly, oversized human lasagna resort at sea. I personally really love the look of her, but I know that there are some, especially in the ocean liner community, who do not. To truly understand the significance of Oasis of the Seas' contribution, not just to the cruise industry, but to passenger ship design and history as a whole, 
we need to take a very broad look at the history of the passenger ship. The story of economic and associated risks regarding size, construction, and new additions has been around since their inception. Ever since the birth of the ocean liner with the SS Great Britain in 1843, companies and individuals needed to find new ways of attracting passengers in a very competitive market, which was the transporting of immigrants, cargo, mail, and the members of high society to and from different points around the world. The evolution of these passenger ships for much of history, like civic buildings and skyscrapers, have been painfully slow. But that first great step was being made by several key ships, companies, and individuals starting around the 1840s. With regard to the timeline of modern passenger ships, I personally like to group it up into several sections, each starting with groundbreaking, breakthroughs in design, construction, technology, operation, etc. It is essentially my version of a generation list for passenger ships. This list is very broad, and focuses mainly on express vessels, and there are definitely exceptions dotted everywhere. The first section would start between the late 1830s and 1840s through to 1870, and this is what I call the birth of the reliable passenger and cargo ship. Some key figures were definitely Insbard Keen of Brunel, Samuel Cunard, Edward Collins, Brody Wilcox, and Arthur Anderson. Those early companies included the P&O, Cunard, Collins, and Inman lines. Key ships included the SS Great Western, SS Great Britain, the SS City of Glasgow, RMS Britannia, and SS Great Eastern. These ships pioneered regular and safe crossings for both passengers, but mainly cargo and mail. Passenger comforts were starting to be taken into account, but it was still extremely utilitarian. The next section would be from 1870, with the completion of White Star Line's SS Oceanic, through to 1899, with White Star's second Oceanic. Titled the beginnings of modern ocean liners, ships during this era began to implement things like steel construction, safety standards, and passenger comforts and luxuries that had only recently been invented on land, such as electric lighting, steam machinery, and plumbing systems. This is when passengers and their comforts began to be more focused on. Famous ships here included, but are not limited to, SS City of New York, RMS Campania, and SS Servia. The next section, the Statements of Power and Prestige slash Floating Palaces section, starts at around 1897 with the SS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse and continues until World War I in 1914. Here, ocean liners began to take on new meanings, grow substantially in size, and would employ technologies that would push them to the limit in areas like speed. Competitions, official and unofficial, would come out of this first great international shipbuilding race. At the pinnacle were ships like RMS Olympic, SS France, and SS Imperator. The next section is not really a period of technological progress, but rather an economic development that would help in the cruise industry down the road. I call this the Rebuild and Maintain section, and it goes from the end of World War I through to 1929. Here we see lots of companies, understandably, not taking much financial risk, trying to maintain what they had, and most importantly, rebuilding fleets cookie cutter style, which can be seen most prominently in the Cunard line. Then comes the Statements of Power and Prestige, Floating Palaces Part 2 section, which starts at around 1929 through the beginnings of World War II between 1939 and 1941. Here Germany's SS Bremen, SS Europa, and early on France's SS Ile de France started a new shipbuilding race with pretty much the same criteria and outcomes as the first 1897 through World War I section, but just on steroids. Pretty much all of the legendary and well-known ocean liners remembered today come from this area, such as RMS Queen Mary, SS Normandy, SS Rex, SS New Amsterdam, and SS America. After that is the Uncertain and Unstable Industry section, which starts following World War II and continues through till about 1970. Here we continue to see parts of the shipbuilding race that once was, with some additional criteria 
such as wartime capabilities being put front and center. The SS United States of the United States lines is by far the best example. But with the onset of the Jet Age, which arrived in the late 50s, the Ocean Liner's core purpose, first really capitalized on just a hundred years prior, was beginning to fade. Liners like SS France and SS Michelangelo were a part of a dying breed. Equally, we see liners beginning to make transitions into a new market, cruising. Most had to be converted, but were definitely successes. SS Caronia, SS Canberra, SS Rotterdam, and RMS Queen Elizabeth II are all major players in this era. Companies that seemed to do the best in transitioning were the p and Cunard, and Holland America lines. Now here is where sections become a little shorter in length and begin to focus on cruise ships rather than ocean liners. The next section is the beginnings of mass cruising. It starts at around 1970 and goes through to the mid-1980s. Here we see the births of the two current largest cruise lines, Carnival and Royal Caribbean. The Princess and Norwegian cruise lines had been founded just before the 70s as well. Many ocean liners are now being converted permanently into cruise ships. Various ports and destinations begin to open up, and cruising becomes a more welcoming and affordable industry than before. Early ships included Mardi Gras, Song of Norway, and it says Eugenio C. Next is the purpose-built cruise ship section that goes from around the mid-1980s through to 1996. Here cruising is becoming so popular that companies can afford to build their own ships, a very expensive and long process. Additionally, more cruise lines enter the arena, such as MSC and Celebrity. These companies find ways to massively grow their fleets and increase efficiency. Most famously, Carnival brings back what Cunard did in the 1920s with their cookie cutter approach with their very successful fantasy class ships. They and Royal Caribbean in particular began to introduce extremely large ships that added so much space that added additional features never thought possible such as multi-story atriums. Sizes of these cruise ships were usually around 40,000 to 75,000 tons. Now we get to this important generation, dethroning the ocean liner, the 100,000 tonners. Starting in 1996 and going through 2009, cruise ships and the industry have grown far beyond what the ocean liner industry ever was. It starts with Carnival Destiny. We then continue to see cruise ships built in huge sizes, usually around the 100 to 110,000 ton range. Then Royal Caribbean began their domination with the nearly 140,000 ton Voyager of the Seas. By now cruise ships were getting so big and were adding so many features that we still see around today, such as balcony rooms and numerous exterior water features. Now here is why the beginning of the last generation matters. Ever since the cruise industry started, there was always the question of how big is too big? Meaning how big can we go before one, people will not want to be on it with so many other people, two, before the ability to dock in many ports becomes difficult or the ship's performance is compromised, and three, construction will become next to impossible due to existing infrastructure and complexity. The charge to go bigger has really been led by Carnival and Royal Caribbean, although Carnival, in a very understandable move, decided to forego the mega cruise ship venture around the 1990s and opted to continue with the very profitable and successful cookie cutter shipbuilding approach. Ever since then, it really has been Royal Caribbean taking the risk of building ever so slightly larger ships that many speculated would exceed in a bad way, those three big limits mentioned earlier. Beginning with the Sovereign class ships, it was a step up, but it was not overly crazy. It was then the same story with the Voyager class ships. They then decided to push the envelope even further with the Freedom class vessels, but they were still, on paper, slightly enlarged versions of the Voyager class, which had proved to be a success. The goal was always the same, offer as much choice as possible. By looking at the successes they were having and seeing that it actually may be a good thing to go even bigger in size, the company decided to take one of the cruise industry's biggest risks 
and began to plan for a ship which will offer the widest array of features, venues, and activities possible. And so in my final generation, we enter the era of the mega cruise ship, and it all started in 2009 with the Oasis of the Seas. By now, you may be asking yourself, why has he gone on this extremely long rant that really has nothing to do with Oasis of the Seas herself? As I stated before, she really is the dawn of a new age, a revolution as well as an evolution. By examining the passenger ship timeline I have put forward, and seeing what ships made those transitions in progress, I hope that you can begin to see in some ways why Oasis of the Seas is truly a ship that should be remembered, and will hopefully remain prominent in the history books of passenger ships. With that out of the way, let's look at her development, life, and what makes her a generation starting ship. The story of Oasis of the Seas begins with her owners, Royal Caribbean International. As mentioned before, they have been pushing the envelope and creating vessels at such a scale, willing to take those associated risks well before or much more than their competitors were. By building these vessels at greater sizes, it allowed them to add so many features that had never been seen before at sea. Oftentimes, people would wonder how it was possible. On previous ships, they had added, for the first time, surf simulators, rock climbing walls, ice rinks, inline skating tracks, cantilevered whirlpools, multi-level atriums, glass elevators, kid-specific water zones, and much more. Some of them even featured the largest single rooms ever put to sea. The room is called the Royal Promenade, which features a city street-like atmosphere with many public spaces, restaurants, bars, and lounges branching off of it. Their main reason for doing all this was to attract more people than just the normal cruisers. By making their ships bigger and adding even more features to them than their competition was, their hope was to attract more so-called non-cruisers. Well, judging by the growth in popularity as well as the significant size increase of their ships during that process, it's clear that this venture worked. By the mid-2000s, the question of how big is too big seemed to be something that had not reached its ceiling yet, despite the constant warnings and criticisms. This gave the company confidence in pursuing a new class of ships that would completely blow all competition out of the water in more ways than one. Like the Sovereign, Voyager, and Freedom classes before, Royal Caribbean took the risk and asked for at least one, possibly a pair, of the largest passenger ships the world had ever seen, something that turned out to be almost twice as big as the largest of their competitors. Little did they know that this yet unnamed project would go on to become one of the most successful classes of passenger ships would expand far beyond what was intended, and would both revolutionize them and the makeup of the cruise industry. The intent originally was not to make these ships as big as they turned out to be. They knew they wanted to go bigger than the Freedom class, but it was all driven with the idea of giving the cruiser the best variety of choices possible. Starting out, they listed what they wanted and began to design a ship around that criteria. As they continued to add more things, the size kept increasing, raising the risks and stakes even higher. Among the criteria were some of the following. To take features found on previous Royal Caribbean ships and expand them further. To introduce new WOW Factor features. Create special environments dedicated to different purposes. To be more environmentally friendly and efficient. Be more opening towards the outside world. And most importantly, Provide an atmosphere that will draw those who may not want to necessarily know that they are actually on a ship, but instead on a luxury resort. Royal Caribbean believed that there was a fairly large group of potential customers that would love to go on a cruise, but are simply afraid of the sea. I myself know people like that. They wanted to give them a ship that would help alleviate or minimize that fear. According to Executive Vice President Hari Kalavara, the project went through at least 18 different iterations before settling on one final preliminary design. The design team and executives knew they were making something special. Royal Caribbean Group Chairman and CEO Richard Fain, the man really behind the major success the company and their ships have had over the years, 
stated about the project that this isn't just a bigger ship. This isn't just better than we've done before. This is fundamentally different. By New Year's 2006, the company had been collaborating with several different architectural firms and the Atkar Yards shipyard based in Turku, Finland, on a design for the new megaship. With the preliminary design settled on and renderings made, Royal Caribbean announced that the new class of ships was in the works on February 6, 2006. Under the name Project Genesis, an order was placed to the Atkar shipyard and renderings were released to the general public, along with several early but mind-blowing statistics. The now rumored Genesis of the Seas would weigh in at upwards of 220,000 gross registered tons, almost 43% larger than Freedom of the Seas tonnage. She would be 1,180 feet long and 154 feet wide. She would be able to comfortably accommodate 5,400 passengers and double occupancy and at least 1,500 crew members. While not confirmed, there was an opening to possibly ordering a second vessel of this type in the future. Above all, she would feature both expanded returning favorites and spaces no one thought would be possible. Immediately, articles and opinion pieces began to flood the internet. Some expressed excitement at the prospect of such a ship. Others, unsurprisingly, were extremely critical of it, saying among other things, that it was too big and that the current cruising infrastructure and common passenger criteria could and would not support cruise ships of that size. Carnival's CEO even unfavorably compared her to the Mall of America. Still, the company, as always, continued to push forward. By March 2007, they had announced a second Genesis vessel would be built. That one was ordered on the 31st of March as yard number 1364. Knowing that a ship this size had never really been attempted before, Numerous physical and computer model tests of various kinds were performed before any construction started. These tests mainly focused on stability, safety, smoke generation, distribution, flow, passenger comfort, efficiency, seat keeping, emergency response, and so much more. On the 12th of November 2007, the keel was laid for yard number 1363 at the Atkar shipyard in Turku. On the 23rd of May, 2008, the names for the two vessels were released following a competition. Earlier that year, the company had allowed the general public to vote on possible names through USA Today. The results then went to a panel of five judges, which included well-known Ocean Liner historian John Maxstone Graham. About 91,000 entries were submitted. Since the poll no longer exists online, I used a Cruise Critics form regarding the USA Today poll to find some of the name choices. The choices included but were not limited to Utopia of the Seas, Serenity of the Seas, Mosaic of the Seas, Coronation of the Seas, Oasis of the Seas, Epic of the Seas, Amazement of the Seas, Mystique of the Seas, Paradise of the Seas, Essence of the Seas, Triton of the Seas, Challenger of the Seas, Allure of the Seas, Discovery of the Seas, and Innovation of the Seas. The name picked for the first vessel was Oasis of the Seas. The second would be known as Allure of the Seas. Funny enough though, neither of those names were among the most popular. Oasis was the 24th most common, with 816 submissions, and Allure of the Seas was the 25th most requested, with 806 submissions. The most popular submission was actually Serenity of the Seas, with 2,457 submissions. Following the announcement, a brief tease was given by the company, saying the ships would feature an area called Central Park, which would feature hundreds of live plants and trees surrounding several restaurants, shops, and an art gallery. While the whole of the newly named Oasis of the Seas continued to rise, the shipyard had an ownership and name change in the second half of 2008. By November, the shipyard was owned by STX and was renamed STX Turku. Before the float-out ceremony, STX released a promotional pamphlet showing off renderings of the interior and exterior of Oasis. Under the name Creating the Incredible, 
The brochure showed off renderings of the Aqua Theater, Central Park, Boardwalk, Royal Promenade, some of the high-end suites, and exterior of the ship. It also gave details about the new sections, called neighborhoods, as well as many new and updated specifications and descriptions of passenger spaces. Finally, after about a year of construction and the welding together of the 181 grand blocks that made up the ship, the float out of Oasis of the Seas occurred on the 21st of November, 2008. During the float out, one of the tugs failed to maintain proper control and Oasis's stern bumped the pier. The damage, thankfully, was mainly cosmetic. She was then towed to the fitting out berth and the dry dock was now free for Allure of the Seas to begin construction while Oasis would be fitted out just ahead. With construction now underway on the second ship, the cruise industry began preparing to accept these new leviathans. Most famously, Royal Caribbean built Terminal 18 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, as that port would be Oasis' home port. At the time, it was the largest cruise ship terminal in the world. Also of note was the port of Nassau's harbor expansion, which required them to massively increase the size of the basin. Many months of dredging would need to occur in order to accept Oasis and Allure. In June of 2009, Oasis of the Seas left Turku for the first time to be put through her paces. Throughout her sea trials, she performed exceptionally well. Many of the people overseeing the test were quite surprised regarding how stable and quiet she was, even when they tried to make her roll during the high-speed turn portion. Upon return to Turku, her interiors continued to be fitted. On October 28, 2009, Oasis of the Seas was essentially complete, almost four years following the first public announcement by Royal Caribbean, and nearly six years after she was first conceived. The ceremonial handover occurred later that night. She was truly quite a sight. While very much evolutionary with regards to other Royal Caribbean ships, she was very revolutionary, and the cruise industry would never be the same again. I mean, where do you start when talking about what she is made up of? Well, for starters, she came out at a whopping 1,181 feet long, 154 feet wide at the base, while being 198 feet wide at the maximum, and has a weight of 225,282 gross registered tons. Among her many evolutionary features are the largest world promenade yet, two rock climbing walls, two surf simulators, a massive mini golf course, numerous suites, 21 swimming pools and hot tubs, 24 restaurants, and an ice skating rink. Among her revolutionary side are the following, a split central superstructure, being over 200,000 tons in weight, having a total passenger capacity above 6,000, having the first aquabatic theater at sea, known as the Aqua Theater, a zip line, a slow moving elevator bar, the first and largest live garden at sea with 12,000 plants, the first carousel at sea, the first inward facing guest rooms at sea, and the introduction of the neighborhood concept, that is, spaces dedicated to a specific theme and crowd. She carries seven such areas. Oasis also features 18 large lifeboats, so large in fact that regulations actually prohibited them from being created. The Safety of Life at Sea, or SOLAS regulations, called for lifeboats that could carry up to but not exceeding 150. In order for Oasis to be able to evacuate everyone on board, she would need to have 44 of them. That could not happen with the space available. The regulation did say that it could be wavered, but only if the need could be demonstrated. After presenting the issue, the waiver was granted, and Oasis carries 18 CRW-55 Mega Lifeboats that can carry 370 people each, or 6,660 people altogether. Oasis is powered by three Varzella 16-cylinder, 16V46D engines that drive 24,780 horsepower, as well as three Varzella 12-cylinder, 12V46D engines that produce 18,590 horsepower. She has three 20-foot-wide Azipod propellers and four 13-foot-wide bow thrusters. There is so much more I could say about her, but I think I'll just leave it at that. Two days following her handover to Royal Caribbean, 
Oasis of the Seas departed her birthplace for the last time. The criteria for her departure were extremely tight. Because of her size, the bottom of the harbor for the first nautical mile would be only about three feet from her keel. As a result, she could not steam out in that first portion under her own power, so the winds could not exceed more than 10 knots. The morning conditions could not have been any better. It turned out to be a crisp and clear morning with winds at or less than four knots. Oasis departed Turku early that morning with many of her builders and their families watching. The day following the departure, Oasis faced her next obstacle, the Great Belt Bridge in Denmark. The bridge had always been an imposing obstacle for cruise ships departing out of Turku, and Oasis would be no exception. The required clearance of the bridge at the center is 213 feet, but the height of Oasis requires at least 236 feet of clearance. How was she going to get through? Well, she then unveiled one of her revolutionary features, retractable smokestacks. They also utilized a well-known hydrodynamic maneuver called the squat effect. By increasing the speed of the ship to 20 knots in the shallow water, a difference in pressure would be created just under the ship, which would pull it down even further, in this case an additional 12 inches. With the waves moving at well over 20 knots, and her smokestacks retracted, she passed under the bridge with just two feet of clearance. Following a brief stopover in the English Channel, Oasis headed out for the North Atlantic on her way to Fort Lauderdale. As she began to enter the ocean, she ran into a massive storm, which produced hurricane force winds and waves averaging around 40 feet. The ship's experienced crew, again, were amazed at how well she performed in stability and response in such rough conditions. Captain William Wright, one of the company's most senior captains, stated during her upcoming maiden voyage that she is the most stable ship, not just cruise ship, the most stable ship I have ever been on board. She has amazed us. Eight days following the handover, she broke free of the storm. On the 13th of November 2009, the world's largest passenger ship entered Port Everglades and docked at the newly completed Terminal 18. She was surrounded and welcomed by many thousands of onlookers, fireboats, helicopters, and boats of every kind. Even a banner plane flew overhead. Oasis of the Seas was now home, and on the 30th of November was officially christened. Several days of final preparations and test runs for her upcoming main voyage followed. The big day finally came on the 5th of December, 2009. The ultimate $1.4 billion gamble that Royal Caribbean had been pursuing for all of these years was now front and center and was ready for her final big test. What would her first group of passengers think of her? Equally at stake was the question that so many cruise lines have been asking and yet avoiding in various ways for so long. How big can you go? The answer was finally going to be given. Under a light overcast sky, Oasis of the Seas departed Fort Lauderdale on her maiden voyage, which consisted of a seven-day cruise that included the ports of St. Thomas, St. Martin, and Nassau. It did not take long to find out whether or not she would succeed. In the end, she turned out to be an absolute sensation. She truly wowed her guests in more ways than one. Royal Caribbean's gamble was beginning to pay off. Over the next few years, Oasis entered at Dry Dock twice for minor refits. However, when she entered Dry Dock for the third time in spring of 2019, two cranes collapsed onto her stern. Thankfully, no one was killed, but eight people suffered injuries. The damage to Oasis, though, was so extensive that she had to leave the shipyard in the Bahamas and head to Cadiz, Spain for repairs. By early May, she was back in service. However, she would be back in that same shipyard later that year. In September, she entered Dry Dock for a $165 million refurbishment. It was part of Royal Caribbean's fleet-wide oil amplification project that focused on adding features to older vessels that were starting to fall behind in providing the most up-to-date passenger experiences. Between September and November, many venues and structures were added. They included an updated pool deck with the perfect storm water slides and splash away bay, an escape room, several new restaurants, including El Loco Fresh and Playmakers, 
Bionic Bar, Music Hall, Sugar Beach, The Ultimate Abyss Dry Slide, a complete and final update to her funnels, an updated solarium, an expended lime and coconut bar, and much more. However, the one upgrade that I personally am not a fan of is the addition of several large suites and rooms just above the bridge. From an aesthetic standpoint, it just ruins the front for me. I like to call it the Aquitania upgrade. In December of 2019, about a month out of our refurbishment, Oasis was nearly struck by the Carnival Legend while docked in the port of Cozumel, Mexico. Carnival Legend had herself been in a collision earlier that day with the Carnival Glory and had resulted in damage and one minor injury. Thankfully, Oasis was not touched. By now, she was operating out of the Port of Miami rather than Port Everglades. Following the reopening of cruising in 2021, Oasis of the Seas continued to operate out of the Port of Miami but was temporarily transferred over to running Caribbean cruises out of the port of Cape Liberty in New Jersey during the summer of 2022. As of the making of this video, Oasis of the Seas is continuing to sail for Royal Caribbean International out of the port of Miami, mainly on six to eight night cruises into the Caribbean. It is safe to say that Oasis of the Seas is a major victory for Royal Caribbean. Let's rewind once again and get a bit of an idea of how much the Genesis project has grown as the years went by. Oasis first entered service in December of 2009. By December of the following year, the Lure of the Seas entered service and saw equal amounts of success as the newest and largest passenger ship ever. The new duo consistently received so many near full voyages that, in less than two years, the company ordered a third Oasis class ship. Built in the Chandeliers de l'Antique shipyard in Saint-Nazaire, France, Harmony of the Seas brought forth even more out of the Oasis design. Another ship was ordered in May of 2014 and was also constructed in Saint-Nazaire. At just over 228,000 tons, Symphony of the Seas remained the largest passenger ship in the world for the next four years. Just before I went on my first cruise, the fifth Oasis-class ship, Wonder of the Seas, which was rumored to be originally named Melody of the Seas, entered service. At nearly 237,000 tons, she had been ordered all the way back in 2016, and is definitely a very modern and improved version of both the Oasis and Harmony versions of the class. In 2019, a sixth Oasis-class ship was ordered and was laid down in San Nazaire in April 2022. Utopia of the Seas, from what I have seen, will be a near-exact copy of Wonder with some minor upgrades. What is not as well known is that negotiations were taking place with the San Nazaire shipyard to build a seventh Oasis-class vessel under the title of B-35. But since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, nothing more has been reported on this, so it is unknown if Royal Caribbean will end up pursuing her. I think it is safe to say that just by looking at that, the Oasis class is a success. They are, in many ways, and for better or worse, the face of Royal Caribbean, the faces of the cruise industry, and the faces of modern passenger ships as a whole. Remember, when that first conceived, Oasis was such a big gamble that the company originally only planned to order one with the possibility of a second. The class now consists of five of the largest passenger ships ever, with a six on the way, and maybe even a seventh. The question of how big is too big still remains, as it is now being asked once more, with many cruise ships currently being built. But the Oasis of the Seas and her sisters have helped answer the question that it is good to expand in big ways. Since their commissioning, rivaling cruise lines have begun to catch up, but none have attempted to overthrow the Oasis-class ships. And now, as of the making of this video, the company is pursuing an even larger class of ships, one that was not even planned to exceed the Oasis's in size. Yet in their success, and in pursuing their goal to attract as many forms of customers as they can, Royal Caribbean is currently developing a class of ships that may even render the Oasis class vessels in some ways obsolete. The icon of the seas and our two currently planned sisters will continue that legacy that the company has paved throughout the decades. I would not be surprised at all if even more sisters of Icon are ready to be born 
but are simply not yet announced, as it was with the Oasis sisters. When Royal Caribbean International first set out in creating what would be the Oasis class, they faced a lot of honest criticism. They were faced with the same feedback as all other innovative passenger ship companies when they wanted to create the next great vessel. Even in its early years, it was thought to be impossible to safely and reliably cross the Atlantic in a steamer, much less do it profitably while their passengers traveled in style, comfort, and luxury. It is because of individuals and companies like Anza Bartkina Brunel, Samuel Cunard, and Thomas Ismay that did the impossible and created a new industry. In today's cruising market, many questions loomed about, the most opposing of which was how big is too big? Many cruise ships and companies found ways to improve, but were unwilling to take it to the next level. Some got close, like Carnival did with their Pinnacle project. They wanted to go big, not only for the sake of saying they had the largest, but also because they knew the many benefits that included adding so many new and exciting thrills, features, and venues that their customers would enjoy. Royal Caribbean were willing, really since the 1980s, to take the risk and grow slightly bigger, first with the Sovereign class, then the Voyager, then the Freedom. Each time they brought forth new standards and demonstrated the viability of these projects. Eventually, whether quickly or gradually, their competition caught up, seeing the benefits and improving them further. The Genesis project was one many decades in the making, both directly and indirectly. Her owners, knowing full well what they were risking in creating a ship of such a scale, took that small but very significant step and brought forth a new breed of passenger ship. Today the cruise industry is very different. The ships have gotten bigger, bolder, more efficient, and more innovative. Like any industry or product, some people do not like that, but there are many others who do. There are people out there who do not like the Oasis of the Seas or her sisters for various reasons, whether they are too big, too ugly, very inward looking, or for other reasons. The Oasis ships by all means are not perfect, but like ocean liners of the past, they are all test ships, seeing what works and what doesn't. If the critics turned out to be right from the get-go, Oasis and Allure probably would have been the only 160,000 ton plus passenger ships in existence today. The ceilings would have been found, and the industry would know better than to take the risk. But despite their extensive or personal faults, they all thrive today, and many other impressive large cruise ships thrive with them, carrying thousands of passengers at a time to various destinations around the world. I personally adore the Oasis class for various reasons. I've been lucky enough to see three of them in person so far. I will also be taking my next cruise in just a few weeks on Wonder of the Seas, and I cannot wait. I hope this video gives you an idea of why I love them, and that it shows you that cruise ships like Oasis of the Seas, while not on the same playing field as the ocean liners of old, is a continuation of their legacy, one that will continue to thrive and evolve as risks are taken, faults are found, and solutions are implemented.
stars in the sky Did we ever stop and wonder why We let our love shine all through the night Just you and me, babe, until the morning light The morning